This presentation will be considered more of a summary of information that you would have gathered from the previous lecture as well as your readings and activities on Wilhelm Wundt as well as previous classes. So let's talk a little bit about more on Wilhelm Wundt and experimental psychology. To cover a few points here, Wundt on the rise of psychology. Psychology was about human existence, not helping people. We've seen this before, particularly when it gets to structuralism, which we'll talk shortly. Uh, structuralism, this is one of its major issues. The whole idea of many of the sciences, including psychology, they were modeled after natural sciences. Remember, this was after the time of Newton, and Newton had made a big splash, so to speak, in the whole area of sciences. And so many modeled after his work. How does the mind and brain work were some of the key questions. The mind is not a location but a process. So they were looking m much at what the diff different various processes were that made the brain and the mind particularly function. Why 1879, the birth of psychology? Well, the key thing here is that this was the first time space and resources were provided to a location and the named experimental psychology being employed in an academic setting. Philosophical Studies was considered to be the first true psychological journal, started around the same time. Wundt wanted to find causal explanations for psychological phenomena. He did not rely on the use of introspection a great deal, even though he did utilize it. Volunteerism, which again has some debate whether or not it was the first school of psychology. Psychology's goal was to understand both simple basic processes of the mind and complex conscious phenomena. For simple phenomena, experimentation could be used, but not so for the complex phenomena. Such things were looking at higher mental processes and would have to be using different technologies or techniques in order to examine those phenomena. Volunteerism, volunteering seeks to understand experience. The two types of experience that he thought of was immediate and immediate. The immediate experience and data are obtained via measuring devices and thus is not direct. But the immediate experience and data are events in human consciousness as they occurred, as it's happening at that moment. So volunteerism holds that immediate experience is the subject matter of psychology. So volunteerism studies two types of immediate experiences. Sensations occurs when a sense organ is stimulated and impulse reaches the brain, described in terms of modality, intensity, and, and quality. Feelings accompanied sensations and could be described along the three dimensions we previously discussed, pleasant, unpleasant, excitement, depression, tension, relaxation. Wundt wanted to catalog all the basic immediate experiences and form a periodical table of elements, as chemistry did. The way to observe consciousness is through the method of introspection. Introspection, or internal perception, observation of simple processes under very careful conditions that can be replicated key idea of replication here. Observers wanted extensively trained at least 10,000 observations before they were considered to be trained individuals in the use of his type of introspection. Volunteerism's account of perception. Perception is interaction between the stimulation present the physical makeup of the person and the person's past experience. So we have the object in, quote, the real world, the stimulation present, the physical makeup of the person, the physiological capabilities of that person, and the person's past experience, their education, their biases, their, their focuses, and those types of things. The part of the field that is attended to is said to be apperceived, selectively attended, perceived. And then the idea of creative synthesis. Elements which are attended to can be arranged and rearranged as a person wishes. Thus arrangements not experienced before 
can be produced. So we go out there, we selectively attend to certain things, we attend to that, the other thing, and then we can put those things together in unique ways that creates a creative synthesis. Mental chronometry. Wundt used the method developed by Donders. Donders was one of the founders of the science of ophthalmology. He uses to measure differences in reaction time to different mental activities required by experimental situations. Today, mental chronometry is one of the most common tools used to making inferences about learning, memory, and attention. It's basically measuring the time it takes to, to accomplish certain types of things mentally. Mental and psychic causality. Physical causality treated as a polar opposite to psychological causality. Physical causality is a reality because events could be predicted on the basis of antecedent conditions. A happens before B, before C, and so on. We can see these objects and physical things and we can sort of predict what's going to happen. Psychological causality was not possible. Although willed, Selective attention and creative synthesis is not physically caused by antecedent conditions which can be known. We just don't see them. That is the question of the black box, these things occurring in the mind. Volker psychology uh, or cultural psychology is the higher mental processes could not be studied experimentally. So they needed other ways in order to study these higher level processes. These methods would employ the study of such cultural products as religion, social customs, and so on as we've talked about previously. Wundt rejected materialism. He agreed with Mueller's vitalism and rejected, uh, vitalism and rejected uh, Helmholtz's materialism with regard to the mind. Consciousness cannot be possibly be derived from any physical qualities of material molecules or atoms. But he was also a determinist, acknowledged that the processes underlying volitions may not be known or knowable, but they are controlled by law. So the idea is things are determined, we just do not know uh, what these things actually are. So looking at the consciousness a little bit, we have these physical compounds. Uh, ideas composed of several sensations. Composite feelings, several feelings mixed together. Emotions, typical form in which affective processes occur. Emotions have a temporal quality, beginning, middle, and end. And then these volitions, changes in ideas and feelings that bring an emotion to a close. interconnects the physical compounds. When connections are broken, unconsciousness or sleep results. The process of synthesis is creative, growth-oriented, and leading toward the development of opposites. Everything that is in the field of consciousness at one time includes what is subject to apperception and is perceived clearly, what is subject to apprehension and is not seen clearly, that is background material existing as a potential for apperception. Apperception is a volitional process, that is, it has to do with the will. You choose to focus on something, the apperception, volitional. It is the will that directs the attention is at the basis of the creative synthesis that leads to the construction of knowledge. Our perception in clinical psychology. Projective tests such as the Rorschach and the TAT, the thematic apperception test, are based on the concept of apperception. Why is it that we perceive reality this or that way? Our perception, what we focus on, what we are attending to. Now, you may recall some of the TAT examples or thematic perception tests. Here are some of the things. These are projected tests. So we have this lady here. And this lady is 
hands down, as you can see, our faces in our hands. She's walking out the door, and there's a person laying in bed. Looks like a male, and he sort of slouched over there. The question is, what does this mean? Well, it's going to depend on what you are apperceiving. What are you focusing on? What are you attending to? Now, from the clinical perspective, the idea about projective tests, as you may recall, is that we are projecting whatever is inside us by what we are focusing on or attending to in these particular images. Another example. So what does this story tell? What does this photograph or this painting or picture, what is it telling us? Who are these individuals? What's the whole point? Same here. Did he just hurt her? Is she drunk? What is the case here? The question is that we would project onto these things tapping into what is going on with the client but again it's what we focus on what are we focusing on within these images so in this example here we have and this tad example the descriptive level the boy is practicing to increase his competence okay that's a violin there the other level interpretive level if one practice then he or she will improve. Okay, the next is the diagnostic level. The client has a high need for achievement with a high level of self-efficacy. So you can see at each level, it gives us a certain different type of take on what that particular image actually means. Again here, we ask the same thing. What is the story here? What do you think? Are these people well acquainted? What type of facial expression do we have there? Just to relate how some of the things that we've talked about during this particular part of the lecture, that how this has applications elsewhere. What do we attend to? What are we apperceiving here? And then what are we projecting on to these images? They will tell a lot about what's going on with the individual who's doing the projecting.